Um, and yeah, got back two days ago, but luckily I'm still in the first part of the day before the jet lag hits in, but at noon I'll be totally toast. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about our work at uh, Women for Women in Afghanistan um, and uh, some of our collaborations in the past with Rotary and talk about literacy and some other stuff and then hopefully some time for questions and comments and discussion. Um, so let's jump to the slide. So as you heard, we were established uh, just over 20 years ago, and um, uh, we, we were established with uh, the intent to uh, stand up for the rights of women and girls. Um, that was the time when the Taliban were in power, they were the government of Afghanistan, and they had shuttered all the girls' schools. And there were all these Canadians who said, um, yeah, not on my watch, I don't like this, and we decided to mobilize. And I think most of us imagined uh, it was like a temporary thing, <laughs> you know, that we would we would react and we would do what we could at the time, and here we are, two decades later, still still at it. And today we focused, um, uh, in terms of our field programs, exclusively on education. We really saw that that's where you get the the most bang for your buck, because uh, for myself personally, when when I went to Afghanistan and I was talking about human rights, the women there told me we know about rights and we think we should have them. But we can't do anything about that as long as most of us can't read and write. So like, yeah, duh. So uh, we started focusing on education. And in terms of my own academic path, I went back to school and I did my doctorate in literacy education. And it, things just kind of uh, evolved very naturally to, to this focus on education. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, our programs in education. So we have three in Afghanistan and a fourth program here in Canada uh, that's focused on public engagement. And um, the first one, Community Libraries and Literacy Program, is for people who didn't get to go to school. So they're usually doing adult literacy, life skills, um, after they're of um, you know, the age where they would go to uh, grade school. Um, so that consists of lots of women who um, didn't get to go to school during the Taliban time but want to learn literacy now. And Investing in Basic Education is for children who are in school now. And we focus here on improving the quality of education. There's been a lot of focus on, the, on what you could call metrics, um, opening more schools, training more teachers, employing more teachers, um, and of course, enrolling students after the Taliban. Um, but the focus now needs to be on the quality of education that those kids are getting at school. And thirdly, technology for education, which um, I'm really excited about that area. It can be a little bit of a tough sell sometimes because I think people think um, in very traditional terms about the delivery of education in a place like Afghanistan, that it must be very basic and computers and tech is kind of a luxury, but actually how we see it is that it's, um, it's a shortcut um, where in places where it's hard to get teachers books, we can use technology to circumvent that. So I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. Um, so the uh, first program, um, the literacy program, we call it Afghanistan Loali, which means Afghanistan Reads in Pashto. And um, uh, we, we, we sort of looked at our own literacy classes that we were delivering, and we looked at um, uh, literacy programs by others, and we noticed that many, many women were spending months or years in literacy classes, and they were not becoming literate. So we said, hmm, what could be going on? And we realized they didn't have books. So it's kind of hard to learn how to read without books. They, of course, had a textbook, but it was really dry and dull. And um, you know, when you imagine you're 50 years old, you've never been in a classroom in your entire life, and you've bravely made the decision to go to this literacy class, and you sit and you have to read this dry black and white book that was actually written for kids, not for grown-ups, and you have all this life experience, and this book is not relevant to that at all. It's not. It's not very engaging. It's not fun. So we wanted to introduce the idea of reading for pleasure and enjoying reading, so it wasn't such a, a chore. And so in all of our literacy classes, we put libraries. We put little libraries of uh, usually 300 up to 500 books, and we provided the shelving, and we trained the teacher how to teach and how to be a librarian. So we do a course called Basic Librarianship, and then we have uh, what we call reading coaches go out to all the classes and work with the teachers to help them do fun things in the classes that get the students excited about reading, get them borrowing books, taking them home, reading them to their uh, their kids and families, and um, we saw huge, uh, huge improvements in the uh, rate of literacy acquisition. We were seeing women become literate in months instead of years, and uh, attendance rates going up, and just people in enjoying the, the class more. 
So this is our formula for the class. Uh, we don't do literacy without libraries and books. And we also integrate life skills to make, um, make things relevant for the students. And um, we just finished, uh, we added a first aid chapter in, in our life skills um, curriculum. It was a lot of fun. I had, my dad was a uh, fire chief of West Van, and um, I made him review drafts of the first aid chapter to make sure they were accurate. And then we made all these demonstration videos and subtitled them in local languages. And the teachers got really confident teaching first aid after that when they had these videos to help them. So we do first aid, health, hygiene, um, financial literacy, and a bunch of other life skills uh, within the course as well. And then we help the women sort of plan the next steps. So when they get close to graduation, we talk to them about um, what's next. And we try to get as many of them as possible enrolled in something else, whether that's a vocational training course or if they're young enough to go to grade school and actually earn their high school diploma. So we have women who came to us unable to read and write, did the literacy class in their university now. They actually went back to school, they went through all the grades, um, they did a fast track program, graduated, and they, you know, the sky's the limit for them. It's really incredible. Um, so th these are the libraries, but we call them the library kits, and we put them both in literacy classes as well as schools. So when a, when a class is finished, we move the library into the nearest school in the community, so then the school students can access it and the women can go there and continue to borrow books. Um, so we get them there by whatever means necessary. On a motorbike, taxis, donkeys, in the back of trucks, they arrive all mud splattered um, and then they're put together in, in the classrooms. And we've distributed um, around 270 of these libraries um, and, uh, and then there's more that are out in schools as well. Um, so within this program, we have different, so our sort of structures, we have programs and then we have projects under the programs. So the programs are really long term. So one of the projects in Afghanistan Reads is a uh, project that we do with the Aga Khan Foundation um, in Dakar, um, in northeastern Afghanistan. So just for context, you have like China here, India here, and the stands over there. Um, so Uzbekistan and Tajikistan is just, uh, just there. Um, so we are teaching 1,800 women to read and write in Dakar, and the Aga Khan Foundation does their, um, uh, they organize women into community-based savings groups. They do financial literacy, and the women start businesses and, and borrow. Um, so um, we do the literacy part of that project, and that's funded by uh, the Government of Canada. And uh, family literacy is, is a really important part of the program. Um, we, you know, we know that it can make a huge impact on children's school success when they're read to at home. Um, the research is, is unanimous about that. It's the surest way to give your, your kids the best, best shot at school to read to them at home. And even someone who can't read and write or can't read and write well can still look at books with their kids, point out the pictures. Um, so that's integrated into our program too. And um, I'll tell you in a moment about some of our partners that help us get books um, that are um, for and from Afghanistan. So the second program, um, Investing in Basic Education, our big focus here is on teachers, because they're really the core. You can't have quality education if you don't have good teachers. And in Afghanistan, more than half the teachers have no formal credential as a teacher. They never went to teacher training college. Many of them actually don't have any kind of post-secondary education, and a fraction of them actually didn't graduate themselves from high school. But they're in those classrooms teaching. And so we wanna make sure that they, they gain the skills to do a good job of that and that they um, thus gain some confidence uh, in, in their teaching. So we do an in-service teacher training project and um, we did that for um, eight years and we trained almost 10,000 teachers. It's actually 9,767 or something like that. Um, and we are now moving into the teacher college system and working in the pre-service um, uh, system with the government. Um, so that it's more centralized and we're sort of sharing, um, sharing that work with, with the government and uh, reaching all the, um, all the teachers enrolled in the teacher colleges around there. So that's where we delivered the in-service program um, and uh, we're just uh, uh, starting a, a new pilot project in Kandahar, Nangalhar, and Kabul in the teacher colleges there. Um, that's supported by um, Global Affairs Canada and will then roll out to, um, to other teacher colleges later. Uh, also in this program is our girls' school, the Fatima Tolzara Girls' School, 
So we have 400 girls in the school in Kabul, and um, uh, they are from vulnerable families. Um, so many of them are from single parent households or they're orphans. Uh, many of them are, are from migrant families that left their provinces because of war and came to Kabul. And so to allow them to go to school, they need um, everything provided. School lunches, bags, books, uniforms, shoes, medical care. So we provide all of that so that they can study. And they also take vocational classes. And we sort of use the school to pilot uh, curriculum because it's in Kabul and we can test things out before we roll them out to other schools. So one of the things we piloted here was a uh, computer literacy curriculum. And uh, that is now, we're in negotiation with the Ministry of Education to adopt that as a national curriculum in all schools on computer literacy. So that was quite exciting. And this is the mission statement of the school, or part of it anyways, you can find the full text on our website. And um, this is a picture from the day that we um, sort of drafted the mission statement. And uh, it was very challenging because what's going on here is um, everybody had their ideas about what was, what was the vision of the school? What was the school for? And uh, I was facilitating the session and I thought that you know, there would be consensus that we'd all be of the same mind about what the school is for, but everybody had a different idea. And so this was my attempt to try to um, prioritize. And so we had number one, two, three, what are the most important? But as you can see, there's only two things under number three, so everyone sort of felt that they're their ideas were the most important in number two. So it took us several hours to um, come up with a unified vision about what, what the school is all about. But, um, but we, were, we were happy with it when it was, when it was done. And it is really a, a, a unique place. And uh, some of our girls have graduated now and they're in university and going on to great things. So in the technology for education um, program, we have of course the computer literacy curriculum that we do. But our flagship project is called Dirac de Danesh, which means Knowledge Tree. And it's a digital library of teacher resources, or it started off as that anyways, but it's evolved a little bit to be for everybody because when we looked at who was using it, it was all kinds of people, not just teachers. And the easiest way to think about this is as like a little mini Wikipedia for Afghanistan. So you can go into the library and you can search different topics and you can find uh, learning materials about those topics, and teachers can use them in their classroom, or you can just read and learn about a subject. And you can also share something in the library if you want. If you developed a really good lesson plan um, on you know, electricity, you can submit it to the library. And so it's sort of crowdsourced in that way. Um, and it's in seven different languages. So um, we have English, Pashto, Dari, which is uh, Afghanistan's dialect of Farsi or Persian, and um, uh, Nuristani, Munji and Swaji. And this was the first website in the world in Munji, in the Munji language. So very small, small language, um, not, not standardized. And um, uh, we have uh, over 600 different topics now. So you go to some of the main subjects and there's a drop down menu, you can choose your subject and you can search the library and um, find all kinds of things, full text, lesson plans. And um, here's another, the sciences. So say you're a teacher and you need to teach water evaporation to your grade 10 students. So you can go and search water evaporation for high school level and it'll bring up everything that's in the library and everything is openly licensed so people can use it any way they want. They can change it, they can adapt it, um, they can mix and match, they can translate it. Um, so everything is free and unrestricted and we work with a wide variety of content partners to get stuff into, into our library. Um, and we translate, uh, and we have translated literally thousands of resources, and the way we do that is by working with volunteers in the Afghan diaspora. Because sadly, Afghanistan has the largest refugee population in the world, so Afghans kind of got all over the world. And uh, many of them are educated, and they want to give back to the, the country they left, so we recruit them to translate. Um, we find whatever their specialization is, if someone was you know, a doctor back in Afghanistan, they can translate health materials, um, and then our editor reviews everything and uh, publishes them. So that's what a, a resource would look like, um, and uh, it's all tagged, and then you can see what other language versions it's in. Uh, we have a large uh, children's storybook collection, and we work closely with an organization from India called Storyweaver, and um, we take their stories and translate them to Afghan languages and publish, in, publish them. And they also have our stories on their own, their own website. 
and we print them as well, and we make audiobook versions of them, and they were the first audiobooks in Afghanistan. So you might have the question, how do people in remote parts of Afghanistan access an, an online library? So we have a few different methods that we use. One is the traditional way, where anyone can just go onto a computer, go on their web browser, find a library that way, um, and, and use it as, as you might. Um, but uh, we needed some other methods for them to access it as well. So we have something called DDL Lite, L-I-T-E, and that's an offline version and we use this um, device called a Raspberry Pi that costs about $112 Canadian, and we can connect it to a network of computers and sort of run it as if it was on, on the internet, um, with the exception that it's not being updated. So when there's new books added to the library, um, we have to wait until that network connects, and we can do that with a um, cell phone for a few seconds, and then they get all the new publications and we get all their user data, so the, it syncs with the server. And then they go offline till next month when they do the, uh, the sync again. Um, and that has worked extremely effectively in this, in this environment. So we have that running in several of the teacher colleges. Um, we have an app, most of our users use the library from their cell phones. Um, and finally, we can put the whole library on a tablet and have the tablet in schools. So this is a way to get around the absence of books and of libraries and, and to meet people's need for information um, and to let them sort of take charge of their own learning. So the yellow is where we have DDL Lite um, installations and then the red is where we actually have full online uh, computer labs. And um, wh what we did with that was when we connected a computer lab at a teacher's college to the internet, we didn't want to end up responsible to, for paying the, uh, the internet service charges every month indefinitely in all of these places. So we made a deal with the Ministry of Education where we said, we will pay for the installation of the internet and we will pay for one year of internet charges and at month 13, you take over the costs. But this gives you a year to go through your planning processes, approvals, get it into your annual operational budget. And so we just did that with six, and uh, we're looking at the next, getting the next six online, because that, that did work well. Um, so we have 4,000, uh, this was two days ago I took this screenshot, so almost 4,200 um, materials in the library in 664 subjects, and um, 115,000 or so people who um, have used the library in the last 30 days, um, 15 teacher colleges using um, the library, and then our teams go out all over the country and do demonstrations, both of how to use the library and how to use the internet, because many of our users um, have very little computer literacy as well, so we do both at the same time. And we have users from every single province in Afghanistan, and we just cannot believe where we get emails from sometimes from people who are demanding, you know, I think you need more chemistry resources for grade 11, and it's in like a village in southern Helmand province. Um, so they find us and, um, and they really actively use this. So um, we're confident that technology is a, is a solution for uh, some of the educational challenges that Afghanistan is facing. So those are all projects that we implement. Um, we have a country office in, in Kabul with about 35 staff, and then we have a province uh, office in the car province as well. But we also give small grants to partner organizations that are doing work that complements uh, or is in partnership with our work. And one of our um, uh, grant projects is called the Shafia Fund. And it's a scholarship fund. We give uh, small scholarships, maximum $500 Canadian, uh, to cover costs related to accessing education by girls in Afghanistan. They have to use it for study in Afghanistan. And um, that was established in memory of the Shafia women in Kingston, Ontario, who were um, killed in an honor killing there. And we have a chapter in Kingston, and uh, Kingston was really shaken by this, this tragedy, and they wanted to do something that would, um, that would bring a positive legacy out of the, the memory of uh, these women and girls. Um, so they, they raised the first $6,000 for the fund. And we have um, uh, just under 60, scholars, um, many of whom got the scholarship more than once, so we've awarded it about 75 times, um, and it's about uh, 60 girls going to university uh, from the Shafia Fund. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you may be able to tell, we need books. We need them for schools, and, uh, 
and uh, teacher colleges and literacy classes. So one of our, our favorite partners is uh, the Afghan Songbook. And this is kind of a neat story. The, um, the lady who uh, first made the songbook was an American Peace Corps volunteer. So she was 20 or 21. She went to Afghanistan in the 60s. And um, she ended up becoming a musicologist. So she was interested in music. So she gathered all these um, traditional songs in Afghanistan and made this songbook. And at the sort of peak of the Taliban's regime, um, she was watching the news and um, you know, looking at the, the destruction, the closed schools, and she realized her songbook copy was probably the last one left in the world. So she wanted to republish it um, and uh, sort of do, do it more professionally, illustrate it, have uh, recordings of the songs, uh, a teacher's guide uh, for the book. Um, so we have funded uh, four print runs of her, um, her songbook, and she just did a fable um, book a book of Afghan fables, so we funded um, part of that as well. And of course, we, we have this book in our digital library and in our physical libraries. And then another partner, Hubo Books, um, they produce um, fable uh, storybooks from local fables in different countries. Um, so they have about 12 titles uh, for Afghanistan, and uh, we have all those in all of our libraries and the digital library as well. And then Parsa is, um, community development organization, and we, we support a project of theirs called Sisters for Sisters, which is sort of like Big Sisters. It's a mentorship project for, um, for vulnerable girls, um, and they get matched up with, uh, with mentors to uh, support them. And this is a brand new partner. We actually don't even have a contract with them yet. It's, uh, it's happening uh, this week. Um, we're going to work with the Blind School of Kabul to help them print Braille books. Um, so we can print quite a few books with, um, uh, you know, with, with five thousand dollars. So that's going to be our, our newest partner, and we're really excited about that project. And we're also going to try to find some screen reader software um, for their computer lab. Um, but we're we're trying to find one that works with um, with uh, Afghan Farsi. So how do we pay for all this? Uh, we have this potluck dinner program called Breaking Bread. Um, we do get government grants, and uh, we have support from foundations, but um, those can be fickle. You know, they come, come and go. Um, so what really, what, what is our bread and butter, as I like to joke, um, is this program, Breaking Bread, um, where people hold a potluck dinner, and um, it's fairly easy as a host because your guests bring the food, and then um, uh, they bring a check, ideally, too. And when this first started in 2005, the idea was that you could sponsor a teacher salary for a year with $750 if your dinner raised $750 because that's what a teacher was paid in a year. Um, but the salaries have gone up since then. They've actually doubled. Um, so that will fund the teacher salary for six months. Um, and we, we give uh, dinner hosts the option to support a teacher or a school library kit or a science kit, depending how much is raised. So there's been... Um, more than a thousand of these dinners held across the country, and this is where we actually get um, uh, most of our revenue from. So I have bookmarks for you about this program, if you're interested in looking in, into it. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a very easy way to uh, support our work, and it's fun, too. So that's Breaking Bread, and um, I wanted to mention that our, we have this annual symposium on education in Afghanistan every year in a different Canadian city. And uh, this year it's in BC, it's in Harrison Hot Springs. And so we have a, a nice lineup of speakers and workshops, it's gonna be really fun. Um, that's the first weekend of October. And I have a little bit of information about that as well, if anyone is interested. And um, there's more information on our, our website too about the event. Um, and uh, we're just reaching out to, we've been reaching out to businesses around the Fraser Valley and, and in the lower mainland. Um, to get involved, support it. Um, we're going to have a silent auction and lots of other things. So you can um, see about the, the speakers. We have our country director from Afghanistan who will be coming. And um, yeah, so that's just barely a month away. And then I wanted to tell you a little bit about our collaborations with Rotary. Um, so there, there is a Rotary Club in Kabul and there's another one in Iraq. So there's two in the country. And uh, we've, we've worked um, a lot with the Rotary Club of Kabul, uh, especially for our girls' school, because it's right in Kabul, so it's a nice project for the volunteers of the club to um, come and, and uh, do stuff at the school. 
And most recently, um, so they did a book drive for the library in 2016, but more recently, um, they were supported by a German Rotary Club, and I can't pronounce it, so we've just sort of taken to calling it the German Rotary Club um, uh, among ourselves. Uh, but they, they gathered materials, and then they paid for the um, uh, refurbishment of the bathrooms and construction of new bathrooms, and um, uh, refurbished the library, painting, and the science lab. And altogether, um, they spent about $75,000 on the school. They did it all themselves. None of the money came through us, so it was really easy administratively. Um, yeah, they gave us a lot of uh, amazing support. Um, and then um, we, you know, Rotary funded a school in Jalalabad, in Angkor province. Um, and it, part of the funds were raised through a club in Winnipeg. So they asked if we would monitor the school. So we sent some staff out to check it out and, uh, and found a really wonderful school. Um, running there, so gave them a report on that, and um, and then Karat um, sponsored some um, uh, school kits, school starter kits in uh, in Western Afghanistan in 2016, and this is sort of a uh, unconventional collaboration, shall we say, um, at the Kabul Rotary Club, because um, I would go to the meetings when I was in Kabul. It's a mix of uh, Afghan nationals and expats who who go to the the club there, and. Um, there was an Australian member of the Kabul Rotary Club, and he worked for this uh, compound called Camelot. Um, and uh, they wanted to host an event that would raise money for our programs, um, sponsored by the Rotary Club there. And so we were kind of just goofing around, thinking of a fun idea um, um, that you know people people would enjoy coming to. And I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Sharknado. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of claim to fame is. Um, that it's like the worst movie ever made. It's about a tornado that has great white sharks in it and that attacks. It's just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and so we decided to host the Afghanistan premiere of Sharknado as a fundraiser. I mean, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Looking back, it's like, what, what, what were we thinking? But anyways, loads of people came. Uh, we raised money, it was tons of fun, and we did a bunch of events uh, thereafter. So this is the sort of thing that can arise from Rotarian collaborations uh, on the other side of the world. And just as I wind up here, um, I wanted to briefly mention, um, you've probably been following in the news the negotiation process or the attempts at um, getting to a peace process in Afghanistan. And that has lots of people, especially women, on edge, um, worried that their rights will get bargained away. And they do have something to lose. You know, Afghanistan has changed a lot in the past 20 years, and I can tell you that as, as an eyewitness. I was there right after the Taliban, and the change is, is, is dramatic. I mean, you've never had more kids in school in Afghanistan than you do today. There's lots who don't go to school, but still, we're, we're far, far ahead of where we were in 2001. And um, the country has just, it's transformed. I mean, it was, back in, in 2001, it was on its knees. It was shattered, um, and um, it's a different place now. It's a more hopeful place, and uh, so people really have something to lose, and they are worried, and they need the international community with them, um, saying, hey, uh, don't, don't sell us up the river. So the women's movement is very organized. Um, they're savvy, and um, uh, we try to sort of take their recommendations, their position, and, and bring it to a Canadian audience. Um, and, and advocate for what, what they're demanding. So we're watching this process closely. It'll be part of the theme of, um, of our conference in Harrison um, and um, you know, trying, to, uh, trying to protect their rights. And the other thing I think is important to mention is that um, the education system is, is vulnerable. They are subject to attack. And this isn't accidental. It's not like you know, stray bullets are flying off the battlefield and hitting schools. The schools are being attacked deliberately by the Taliban. That is part of their, their strategy. Uh, they murder teachers, they burn down girls' schools. Just last week, a school just outside of Kabul, girls' schools burned down. Um, they threaten parents against sending their, their kids to school. Um, they burn textbooks, and on and on. And um, this is not at all accidental. Uh, they've sort of figured something out that I think the rest of the world is catching up to, that educated girls are very dangerous. They're dangerous to the status quo, um, and they know that. So they are trying to stop it, 
And I, what I want you to remember is, is that danger that those girls face, but also that they go to school anyways. And that's something to pay attention to. And you know, nothing kills me more than when I come back to Canada and I hear people talking about how, um, you know, oh, those Afghans, uh, that's just their culture. Uh, they don't let their women out. They don't let their girls go to school. I've met the bravest people in the world there, girls who are literally risking their lives to go to a classroom, um, or those women literacy students. And I think we have to hear their message um, as loudly or more loudly than, than the Taliban's um, trying to stop them from, from going to school, because they will shape their, their country up. And, um, and, and we want to be on the right side of history on this one and, and be, there, be there with them, shouting and rooting for them. So that's it. So if you have any um, questions, comments, happy to discuss further. So much. That was fantastic, Lori. Um, I, I'm sure my ignorance, how, uh, who is the present government and how much is the Taliban involved in Afghanistan? Um, so the current, current government is, uh, the president is a man named Ashraf Ghani. He actually is an economist. He used to work at the World Bank. He was educated in the, in the US. He's a technocrat. Um, he has a, a great vision, but he has struggled to govern because it's a complicated place to govern. And uh, he's the second president since the Taliban. Um, so the Taliban were ousted from the government in uh, October 2001, and they then became an insurgency. And they were quite weak for the first few years, but. Around 2008, they, they got a lot stronger and they took over some districts. And in other districts, they have what are called shadow governments. So they have this kind of parallel governance system. Um, and, um, and there are some districts, it's changing all the time, so I can't give you exact numbers, um, where they, they are in power. Um, and uh, the government is fighting and trying to root them out. So there's an active conflict between, between the Taliban and the Afghan government. And um, um, uh, and is this are they the negotiators? And are they the people negotiating peace? Or do they should be, that? but they're they're not. So currently, the Taliban and the U.S. are talking as the two parties in the negotiations, uh, because the Taliban has said we won't even talk to the government of Afghanistan until the Americans leave. Mm -hmm. So that's our condition. Once they go, then we will start direct negotiations. Good. But. You might want to be cautious about you know sort of taking them for their their word at that. Like yeah yeah we'll we'll, be, we'll come in and you know just remove your force that's protecting everybody. Um, and um, they they they're quite good at PR. The Taliban they sort of have planted this idea in some people's minds that they've reformed. They, there's no evidence to that effect at all. They're the same same old Taliban up to the same old tricks. Um, so I, personally, I hope the negotiations fail. Laura, um, what about, like you've told us about the, the Taliban and the, and the move to burn schools and books and everything else, what's the sense of where the um, sort of, the, I don't want to say the ordinary men, but the men in the communities that are part of these families where you're managing to get women and girls into schools, do the, are they supportive, are they uh, invisible, what's the... It runs the gamut. Um, you know, Afghanistan's a hard place to make generalizations about because you can just find everything there. I mean, you can yeah. find men that are absolutely incredibly enlightened that are running girls' schools themselves, that are you know sacrificing to send their daughters to school, and will you know in a very articulate way defend girls' education. And then you'll find people that behave just like the Taliban. They're not Taliban, but their mentality is the same. So you find everything um, depends on sort of people's educational levels. There's a big correlation with that, and if they've been been you know in the neighboring country and come back, or sort of their their own background. Um, but there, there. I mean, there's a sizable number of um, of men who actively support and are part of the women's movement, um, and then lots of families that send send their daughters to school. And you can find specific data in, um, there's a report that comes out every year called a survey of the Afghan people. It's done by the Asia Foundation. They've done it since 2006. So you can now compare changes over time. And um, they ask, they survey them about everything, but one of the chapters is about um, uh, women. And they ask, um, they ask people sort of 
cultural questions about their perspectives on women. Like, would you ever accept a women president? Um, do you support women's higher education? Do you, do you allow your wife to work, et cetera? And, um, uh, and the, it's about 50-50 male-female, so you can, see, um, you can see what men say in differences by provenance and age and education level. All right, one more right. question. Thank you. Uh, please, Peter. Sort of thing, so it's full of books and um, sewing machines and things for for a uh, school. Oh, nice! So awesome. that's one of the things we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> 